Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. I may ask uh, everyone that is uh, not not speaking to mute uh, for the moment. Later, there will be the, the occasion to uh, to ask questions. So, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Anton van Rompuy. I'm a professor of geography in uh, at KU Leuven, Belgium, and I have the privilege to to moderate a bit this seminar that we started um, from the working group uh, rural urban interactions uh, because we thought, uh, yeah, in this in this pandemic times. It's very hard to uh, to meet to team, and it's especially very difficult for for the younger researchers that usually don't have the same network as more senior researchers. So um, we will do this on a monthly basis, and this is the second one. Maybe some of you also attended the first one. It's very nice to see this huge diversity of participants, which really shows that the Global Land Program is an international network. And actually, we're also a bit curious to know where you're from. Uh, and probably you're also curious to know who is in this room. So we have this little uh, poll, uh, which maybe, yeah, there it is, uh, where you can just point which continent are you from. And uh, there is even Antarctica. So if you could submit your answer, then we have some more information about you. I'll do the same. I'm from Belgium, that's Europe. Okay. And I think Lauren, Lauren and Orpiji that, that we will see the results soon. Okay. There it is. Let's see how international we are. So Europe is the winner, 50% from Europe, but we also have all the other continents apart from Australia and Oceania and Antarctica. So we should do a special effort next time to invite or announce this uh, seminar. Uh, also in those continents. But welcome everyone. Uh, so well, uh, today we have again three speakers. The first one is uh, Jasper van Vliet. He's from the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and the Institute for Environmental Studies. And he will talk about uh, urban intensification, urban expansion in China. Then we'll move to uh, Africa, to Morocco, uh, to Meknes, to the University uh, Moulay Ismail, uh, Faculty of Sciences. And there we have uh, Mohamed El Hafiani who will talk about uh, impact of uh, urban expansion on water consumption. And then we'll move to, uh, to the Far East, to, to Vietnam, to Hanoi, to the uh, Vietnamese National University, uh, Faculty of Geography, that is. Uh, we'll uh, give the floor to, um, to Wang Wong, who will talk about the impact of, uh, of tourism on rural livelihoods and land use change. So I think it's a very interesting program, a bit Asia, Africa oriented. I think that's nice. And maybe uh, next time we'll move more to the Americas in terms of speakers and topics. But um, we will do it like this, that we will give um, the floor to the speakers first. And in the meantime, you can already type questions in the chat if you have. And then when um, the talk is finished, then um, you will, uh, you, you, well, the, the speaker will try to answer the questions. At the end, after the three speakers have given their talk, we can also have a short discussion and maybe there is transversal uh, topics that we could uh, discuss. Okay. Um, there is also a Google Docs in which you can type uh, uh, some information about yourself. Okay. And that will be shared also among everyone here present. Is that clear? Is there any questions now? Then you can already type it in the chat and I could answer it. <laughs> but if not, let's, let's start. Okay, Jasper, then we give the floor to you and uh, maybe you can upload your presentation. Yes. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Then I hope all the others can see it as well. Thank you very much, Anton, for uh, uh, organizing this young speaker sessions and for um, uh, allowing me to present some of our recent work. Um, it's uh, I'm, I'm not presenting one paper. I'm presenting a series of papers. And actually, I saw some of the uh, well. Actually, first authors of the related papers are also in here. That's nice. Maybe they can even uh, add some details if I don't know the answer to questions. Um, I'd like to present some of our recent work on analysis and modeling of urban expansion and intensification. Uh, so contrary to what the uh, original announcement indicated, it's not only about China, it's a little broader. Uh, and I'd like to start with the picture in the background. What you see here is actually the campus of our university. 
Uh, I'm not particularly proud of it because it's a bit of a concrete jungle. Uh, but what I think is really nice about it is that it shows a, a, a not so large area in Amsterdam with already a very large variation of, let's say, urban structure. So here you see some well, high rises, or at least as high as it gets in the Netherlands. Um, here you see some mid, uh, like four, five, six story uh, flats. Here you see luxurious villas with large gardens. You also see different functions. This is educational, this is residential, this is commercial, this is a hospital. So this is to illustrate that within a, a small area, there's actually already a lot of, uh, well, let's say heterogeneity uh, in, in urban fabric and urban structure. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. So, um, Yes. Um, already for a few decades, a large number of land use models and also land use change analyses have been uh, uh, published and presented. Here you see an example of the clue model, um, and it, it's a snapshot of a larger uh, simulation study of all of Europe. And uh, the thing I want to point at here is that uh, I know there's no legend, but red, as you might recognize, is urban land. Um, and there's actually only one type of red. There's no different shades. So in terms of urban development, the only development that you can simulate here is a uh, increase or decrease in, in, in urban land, basically urban expansion. Uh, now, that is certainly uh, an, an important signal. Uh, there, there's a lot of urban expansion in some areas in the world more than others. Uh, but there's more than that. Um, and that's where I'd like to talk. Oh about today. So if you take a closer look, you can see differences uh, in, in, for example, area that would correspond to this, this land cover conversion. And I showed it on the left with two villages in Switzerland and uh, the structure is more or less the same. The one on the top is just larger. So that for me kind of represents urban expansion. Then, however, if you can, if you look a little further, you can also see different uh, other differences, for example, in intensity. And I, I, um, I don't want to dive into a definition of what is intensity. I think you can express it in multiple ways. But I, I guess we all agree here that what you see in the top, uh, central Hong Kong, high rises, is more intense use of the urban land than what you see in the bottom, uh, a suburban area somewhere in the US. Now, if you look a little further, you can say, well, there's maybe also other differences, for example, in, in building material and maybe also related socioeconomic status. Uh, so here you see an area in, I believe, Mumbai, where uh, the slums border the, the, the high rises of the people with, uh, well, significantly more money. And that's also expressed in differences in building material. The slums are informal, uh, wood or cardboard, and uh, the, the high rises are concrete. Or on the right, you, uh, I, I try to um, illustrate differences in urban spatial structure. At the bottom, you see large gardens with um, uh, well, uh, villas. And in the top, you see an area with all attached houses, uh, still with quite a lot of green, but uh, much less green space per person. Still quite convenient. It's the area of Amsterdam where I'm living. So it's not really that bad. But the difference in spatial structure is quite clear between the two, I think. And these type of differences, this heterogeneity is uh, not often included in uh, urban analyses and, and, and urban modeling studies. So we started doing that. Um, in the first study, uh, one uh, that was led by Mong Mong Li, um, we used the distribution of built up land, not only the amount, but also really number of clusters, whether it's large clusters or small clusters to characterize uh, what we call settlement systems along a gradient from more urban to more rural. You see the legend in the bottom and on the top left, you have large cities. Now I don't have the whole classification scheme in here, but you intuitively already understand those are areas that are predominantly built up um, and then goes down urban landscapes. There's still a lot of build up, but slightly less. But then the interesting and, and Newer part is what you see in the middle, which we call villages, sparse villages, isolated villages, sparsely clustered towns. Those are different, um, what we call land systems or settlement systems uh, that don't only differ in the percentage of built up land, but that also differ in how they are structured. So um, dense villages can have a relatively high share of built up land, but it's still a large number of small villages dotted over the landscape. 
and all the way to isolated villages, which uh, are maybe predominantly agricultural landscapes, but still with a village in there that is recognizable. Why did we do that? Well, we did that to one, understand uh, how urban development and especially the spatial structure um, took place over time. And second, to learn a little bit more about uh, the, the changes in built up land. So if you look at the bar chart, the one on the top, it's not so surprising. It's the percentage of all land in each of the uh, settlement systems. Now, as you can also see in the map of China, we applied it on China. Um, the vast majority is uh, gray. It's deep rural. There's no build up land, or at least not one that was detected in our input data. Um, and then there's uh, a large part which we call isolated villages, sparse villages, dense villages. So those areas with, with, with maybe uh, a small fraction of build up land, typical in small patches, typically. And then in, in, in red, you see some of the denser areas, and those are a small fraction of the map. So far, nothing new. What I thought was more interesting is what you see in the bottom, the percent of build up area. And if you sum it all up over each of these land systems, what you see actually is that more than 50% of the build up land in China is included in these village systems. That is in, in, in stark contrast with the large majority of the studies that all focus on the few mega cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. So the point here is that in terms of structure, there's a lot of build up land that is not included as mega cities. They're not studied very much, and still they are very important in terms of the overall area of built up land and understudied. What was even more interesting is that although over time we could see an increase in the share of built up land included in, in the, the urban classes, nonetheless, the majority of the addition of all built up land over time was still also in these village systems and town systems. So there is a need to look beyond the, 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 the large megalopolises and, and also focus on, on village growth and, and, and town um, uh, growth. What we also found here, and that's what we tried to show in this small figure in the top right, is that changes aren't typically um, very drastic. There's very few locations that change from, say, deep rural all of a sudden to dense urban. Instead, typically, they're all small incremental changes. And the width of the arrows indicate the, the, the number of pixels that um, um, had a certain uh, type of change. So we saw many changes from isolated villages to sparse villages, meaning just a little more village or just some larger villages, and so on and so forth. OK, so that's spatial structure. Uh, <clears throat> second study, uh, we also looked at urban intensity. And in this case, we expressed intensity as population density. Um, so this graph requires some explanation. Uh, what you see here on the x-axis is three time periods, 1975 to 1990, 1990 to 2000, and 2000 to 2050. Uh, you see it also for three different countries. And what you see on the y-axis is a change in population. Uh, times 1,000 persons. Now, positive means an increase in population, of course, and negative is a decrease in population. And different colors indicated whether this population change is related to um, um, new build up land development and or changes in land intensity or population density in this case within existing build up land. So what we see in the Netherlands is that in the first time period, the vast majority of all population increase was accommodated by new build up land. And actually, the existing build up land got slightly sparser over time, meaning that the population density declined a little bit. <clears throat> now, over time, we see that a smaller fraction of the new population was accommodated by build up land. And actually, there was a, a little bit of densification as well. And so it continues in the last time period. In Switzerland, in contrast, all new population was accommodated by new housing in the period 1975, 1990. But in the most recent period, you actually see that the vast majority of the new population was not accommodated by adding new built up land, but instead by intensifying existing urban land. And the third, uh, even uh, more contrasting, is Romania, where in the 1975, 1990 period, we still see the same picture. Uh, most people are added in new build-up land. But over time, we see especially a decrease 
in the intensity of existing build up land. Now, there are a myriad of uh, processes that could potentially explain this. Maybe smaller families, uh, people getting older, like more single housing families, but maybe also that we're getting richer and living in larger apartments or larger houses. Uh, the point is that this analysis shows that the dynamics in, in urban land aren't only uh, horizontally, spatially by expanding, but there's also large dynamics in terms of getting more intensively used or less intensively used, at least when expressed in uh, population density. Oh. <clears throat> now, a third analysis we did, uh, and this is only part of a simulation study I'll show later, is about building material. Uh, this is a study we did for Southeast Asia um, that includes Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. And we also, uh, we, we characterized the landscapes, at least along the rural urban gradient, with uh, four types of uh, settlement systems. Here you see village, sparse suburban areas, dense suburban areas, and urban dense areas. And they were characterized initially or classified based on population density, but subsequently we used um, uh, Google um, Maps or Street View imagery to also characterize the different building materials. And you see that they don't only differ in population density, but also very much in building material. Typically the villages have a larger share of wood, whereas the, the, the urban dense areas have a much larger share of concrete uh, as building material. Now, why is that important? That's in this case, it was important because we were using this study, this, this model study to make projections of future uh, flood risk and the different materials uh, have uh, different um, impacts in terms of flood risk. Uh, wood is more vulnerable, but at the same time, concrete is more expensive. Good. So that was the first part. I wanted to show that urban areas are heterogeneous, um, not only in terms of the amount of built up land, but really also in their spatial distribution, their um, uh, building material and, and urban intensity. Um, now I'd like to show you two um, studies where we applied uh, this or parts of that in uh, a modeling framework. So the first is uh, settlement changes after peak population in China. It's one that was conducted by Yuan Wang, uh, Wang, and I believe she's in the audience. I think I saw her name. Um, and this is also the study uh, that had the name that was originally uh, announced in the, um, as the title of this talk. And the central question here is, the, is what will happen when the population density, uh, or sorry, the total population in China will decline? What will it mean for urban land or built up land? Uh, so what you see here is the projections or two different projections of the total population in China. Uh, they come from the United Nations Population Division. The blue one, uh, the, the low one, um, projects actually uh, quite a large decrease with a peak somewhere in 2020, 2025. Whereas the red one um, projects maybe a peak somewhere after the 2040s and only a very small decline after that. Now, often uh, urban growth is, is, is modeled as kind of a function of population increase. So you could say, well, you know, if population goes down, maybe we'll also lose urban areas. Thus far, I'm not aware of much evidence suggesting that population decline actually leads to um, a decrease in, in urban land. Um, there are examples of hollow villages in China and there's land abandonment in Eastern Europe and there's probably several other examples, but they're very small scale and it doesn't lead to a significant decrease in build up land. So on top of these two population uh, scenarios, we um, added to uh, an, an extra dimension uh, and that is about average population density. We said, you know, what if we simulate both scenarios with the same population density for the different settlement systems that we find in 2015, our starting point. And what if we allow a continuation of the current change in population density? And the population density for each of the systems has been going down in uh, for, for, for several decades. Again, because maybe because of smaller families, maybe because of increases in wealth or other things. So what it leads initially is, uh, well, we, we needed to make a map, one that corresponds to the uh, settlement systems of China I showed before, but then not only based on uh, the distribution of, of patches of urban land, villages or, or towns, but also um, 
uh, dependent on the population density. Now, I won't guide you through the entire um, um, decision tree, but you see here that for the uh, areas with the large amount of built up land, maybe more than 50%, uh, we subsequently um, distinguish between high density and low density based on the population density per uh, unit area. And the same we did for the medium high uh, uh, shares of built up land, call it peri-urban or suburban. And after that, it was mostly based on land cover uh, types, uh, predominant land cover and a number of clusters also there to distinguish between towns and villages. On the right, you see some uh, examples from Google Earth illustrating what it looks like. So this is typical high dense urban area, a lot of high rise buildings, many people living there, the low density, so lower areas, but still predominantly build up and so on and so forth. And so, so, so we made all combinations. So that leads to four different um, uh, scenarios. And here I show some snapshots and I took some snapshots because I think they show more than, than the entire map of China. Um, what you see in the, in, the, in the first column is the situation in 2015. What you see here is scenario one and scenario two, um, just two out of the four different scenarios. Otherwise it would be uh, too many different small maps to show. And you see here four different uh, case study locations or not case study, but uh, locations that we zoom into. Uh, one here uh, around Beijing, number two here with uh, uh, Shanghai in the southern part of Yangsu. Uh, three is just south of Beijing and four is here in, um, well, partly urban, but also partly the more rural mountainous uh, areas of the coast. And the interesting thing is that scenario one and two, they have the same population demand. It's in both cases, it's, it's the high demand. And still they yield uh, very different outcomes. Um, and I hope you can see the different shades of red on your screen here, where we uh, allow a continuation of the current trends of declining population density. You see that it requires a very large amount of high dense urban areas to accommodate all the people. Whereas if we stick to the 2015 density, um, you, you need much less of that. In other words, uh, the, the, the kind of, I would almost say the, the volume of concrete or, or the, the intensity of the urban land needs to be much smaller um, to accommodate the same number of people. Now, you don't only see that in the large city, <clears throat> you also see it, for example, here in the, <coughs> sorry, I'm a little bit sick, um, in, in the bottom two rows where there are some urban uh, centers included, but also the more uh, suburban or clustered landscape. And it gets increasingly dense here if we continue our population decline the way it, it took place over the last few decades. Um, we also summed it up, and I don't have that here in the slide, but the end of the story is that it makes a significant difference in terms of the total land take, total amount of built up land in China, uh, whether you uh, follow the one path or the other. In other words, um, keeping the population density high or maybe uh, uh, keeping the uh, amount of build up land per person low is a way to actually save land for other uses, which is especially relevant in China because most of the urban expansion is all in the fertile cropland areas. And there is already a challenge of, of uh, maintaining food security in, in uh, national food security in China. Now, a second study that I wanna show, I hope I still have time. Uh, please uh, let me know if I'm going over time, um, is um, the exposure to flood risk. Here we um, did a, use the same modeling approach, but then apply it to Southeast Asia. The, I referred to this study already earlier in, in the slide of the building materials. And we had only two uh, scenarios, one of urban expansion, the other of intensification. They used the same uh, population projections as, as input. And I have a few examples here. This is, for example, Bangkok. And you see that with the intensification, there's a much larger dark red area, the urban dense area in the center. Whereas if we go for the expansion areas, you see more of the pinkish colors on the outskirts, the suburban villages. Now, the same here is it's even much clearer. If you ask me for Phnom Penh, this is Phnom Penh. You see here the Mekong River uh, splitting into the Tonle Sap and uh, the, the Mekong, where this is the current situation. And in the urban expansion, you see a large expansion of suburban areas, uh, whereas in the intensification scenario, we find 
uh, a much more compact development of suburban dense and urban dense areas here. Also here in Vientiane and, and some of the other cities. Now, why is that interesting? Because here we ask the question of which of the two uh, development strategies would yield the highest or the lowest uh, flood risk uh, in the future. Uh, many of the areas in Southeast Asia are exposed to river flood risk um, of the Mekong River, but also uh, the, the, the Red River in um, Hanoi. I think we have another speaker from there. She might know more about it than I do, and several other um, uh, rivers. So we combined the land use projections with the hazard maps, the inundation maps of all these rivers, and the depth damage functions indicating the vulnerability. So <clears throat> here you get the results. And, and, and here you also see actually where the different cities are located. So this was the Phnom Penh example that I uh, showed Vientiane and Bangkok that I took as an example. And the interesting thing is that the different types of, of uh, urban development yielded very different preferences. So um, here in Cambodia, what is very clear in Phnom Penh, what we see is that most of the expansion in terms in the, in, in the, the expansion scenario takes place in areas that are hardly prone to flood risk. So in this case, the expansion scenario yielded a lower flood risk in the future than the intensification scenario. Conversely, in, uh, and this is a, a snapshot of the Mekong Delta, uh, in uh, um, uh, Vietnam, the opposite was observed. Uh, because there, both the expansion and the intensification was expected to take place in areas that are prone to flooding. Uh, and, and, and the damage was much higher in an intensification scenario where you get the, the, the denser urban areas, more people, um, more, more, more costs um, to, to rebuild that. So uh, we didn't find one uniform answer saying, well, in order to uh, reduce flood risk, we should all aim for intensification instead. Uh, some countries um, are better off in an intensification scenario and other countries are better off in an expansion scenario. Good, so those were two of the uh, modeling examples that we recently published and that I wanted to show here. Um, as a take home message, uh, what I'd like to uh, give to you is uh, that I'd like you to remember that urban land is changing in multiple different ways, obviously in terms of extent. Uh, there's many studies on that already but also in terms of urban intensity, also in terms of urban structure or structure of built up land, and also in terms of socioeconomic status or building material. This is just an, an expression of the socioeconomic status, I guess, in these countries. And I think that in order to, um, to, to develop meaningful scenarios and to conduct uh, useful impact assessments, uh, we need to use models that are sensitive towards these differences rather than just uniformly um, uh, simulating uh, urban growth as if there's only one type of urban land. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jasper, for this very nice and uh, well-documented uh, presentation, very rich also based on several papers. So we have the habit here of uh, not applauding like um, like we would normally do in an auditorium, but we can give a reaction like this, you see, or we can even do the thumbs up, or if you really like it, we'd give it a heart, but that's maybe also with some connotations. <laughs> you can do that as audience, I see, I see applause, uh, and Jasper, you can probably see it also, huh? Yeah, yeah. Ah, there is even, uh, <laughs> no, but, yeah, okay. you can even have a party. <laughs> Okay, very interesting, but it's now time for questions. I think I think nobody uh, typed a question already in the chat because they were too busy with uh, following your uh, explanations, I think. But I'm sure um, there is questions. So if you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand, unmute and ask the question. Huh? No questions, maybe the ice needs to be uh, broken a bit. So I will maybe start with a question for Jasper. So um, I really believe, yes, that we should go beyond just urban, non-urban. But there the difficulty is, of course, um, collecting data on this. So do you believe that with the present uh, status of, let's say, remote sensing techniques, um, it's possible to generate the necessary data or should this be complemented with fieldwork also to find out, for example, what, what really the condition of the houses is 
or you think remote sensing is sufficient to do this type of studies like you did and, and uh, many follow will many will follow you i think in this yeah this uh, good you. good question um <clears throat> um <clears throat> it's partly scale dependent. I think uh, there, there are properties that you can derive from remote sensing imagery and Sentinel uh, um, is already a, a large step forward relative to the Landsat satellites of providing uh, more spatial detail. Um, but not everything can be derived from these images. Building material, uh, probably you won't be able to, to do that meaningfully on a large scale. Um, one of the things that I didn't show here is, um, uh, and I know Mong Mong is in the, the, the audience as well, is um, we are also trying to characterize building height and building volume based on, uh, bar, mostly on Sentinel imagery. Uh, that's the radar backscatter. So it's not a way of expressing urban intensity where um, you can um, actually uh, characterize urban intensity, not in population density, but in building volume or average building height. Now you can do that from a satellite. Nonetheless, I see field work or local studies and, and large scale spatial analyses mostly as complementary. The, the local studies I think are, are essential for um, getting well, both the process insights, but maybe also in some cases, even the gathering of data such as building materials. Whereas the larger scale studies benefit a lot from remote sensing, but only give you kind of an idea of the overall size of the process and not necessarily the insights in how it works. So I do think there is a continued need for field work. Um, were it not for COVID, I, 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 I might have been able to actually show you some field work results here as well, but all those activities have been postponed, of course. Uh, but so, yes, I agree. Um, we okay. need to that, that seems interesting, yeah. So it's it's mixed methods. I think that we will need that to collect all these data. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now I see hands that uh, are raised. Uh, so Emmanuel, you have a question. You can unmute. Thank you so much, Anton. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jasper, uh, for the fascinating uh, uh, work. And then I would also be uh, happy if, if I if I can get a piece of publications uh, if there are uh, out of. Uh, uh, this great work. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you have been presenting uh, the urban analysis based on different uh, classifications, and one of them was the urban intensity. Uh, actually, partially, it could have, it, I believe that it's answered uh, from the Anton's question, but I would like you to explain a bit uh, on how, how you were able to connect the vertical urban growth or the intensity with the uh, population growth in the same area, because uh, on the same topic, uh, you were displaying that uh, the population grows in the same area and the population grows uh, with a new area. So uh, to what extent, the extent of vertical growth or urban intensification, how is it necessarily connected with the population growth in, this, in the same area? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it might be a little confusing that I've shown results from multiple different studies. So, so far uh, we have not uh, conducted a study where we compared population density with um, let's say 3D urban structure or vertical um, uh, information. Uh, so the studies I've showed are either um, using population density as an indicator of intensity or, and that's the last slide I showed, using uh, building volume, but not both. Uh, and in the studies where we use population density for the simulation studies, we assumed um, that a certain population density was representative for this urban intensity. But also within each class, there is always heterogeneity, of course. I mean, uh, so so um, that is partly an assumption we make and, and, and one that I think that is valid if you analyze it on the scale of five countries or on the scale of China, but certainly not if you do it on the scale of one or two pixels. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, there was another hand there, which is uh, Martin, Martin van Stream. Martin, yes, uh, th thank you. Um, for, thank you for the very nice presentation, Jasper. Um, it was very interesting. Um, my question is, uh, uh, so, so what you showed are very much um, the results of, of, of let's say, what happened on the ground, just a, a pixel-wise analysis, but are you going to uh, also focus more on trying to uncover the processes that lead to these different types of urban development? I can imagine econ economic developments are very important in this respect because 
there's a yeah whether i guess everybody of us would like to live in in a villa that you showed at the beginning but obviously there is a big uh balance between demand and supply and obviously also the the whole transport system is a, is a big issue in this respect um how far can you live from the place of work are these are you, are you planning to do this or have you already gone in this direction uh well, uh, thank you for your question. Hi, long time no see. No see. Uh, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I would very much like to do that. Uh, we, we're doing several things. One is a study we're currently conducting in uh, three countries in Eastern Africa, where we're um, kind of analyzing the relation between multiple different types of urbanization, where types relate to population density, spatial urbanization, but also uh, social and economic. I mean, share of people living in tertiary sector or maybe social functions like restaurants, bars, theaters, and so on, trying to see how they uh, get together. And in relation to that, we also want to do a field work uh, with, with um, questionnaires on, on the motivations of uh, the rural urban migration there. Um, on uh, determinants of urban uh, or, or population density, uh, a few studies exist. And um, interestingly, there are some cultural aspects as well. Uh, I, I recently learned an interesting difference between uh, Anglophone and Francophone um, uh, countries in Africa, as the one has a tendency to develop much denser urban areas than the other, which probably is a result of the, um, yeah, the, the colonial um, uh, inheritance, uh, inheritance there, that, that maybe they imposed a certain system or they stimulated a certain types of development. And we're currently in three cities in, in the Congo, uh, uh, Bukavu, Goma, and Bujumbura. So that's uh, the, the eastern part of the Congo and, and Rwanda. We're doing a kind of a qualitative study to analyze how these different patterns came along. They are all from the same francophone uh, uh, well, not Francophone, read really, a bit, uh, the, the same colonial history, but still there are differences there. Um, and, and, and so I got several other IDs that I, that I don't want to study there. And, 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 and the challenging thing, I think, will be to, to, well, on the one hand, you want to find some more, let's say, generic rules. On the other hand, uh, urban areas are also, to some extent, idiosyncratic. For an outsider, you could think that Belgium and the Netherlands, they're very similar. Um, you and I, being Dutchmen, we both know that in terms of uh, um, urban development, or let's say settlement development, uh, they are in stark contrast. Um, and, and, and what's that? That's maybe planning regulations, but where does it come from? Uh, so I, I, I suspect, I, I speculate that we can only partly answer it in, in terms of a set of generic rules and that to some extent we need to accept that there's local specific idiosyncratic circumstances that, that, that you can't really capture in a generic global rule. Yep. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. That's uh, hey. very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. I, I think there is many more questions, uh, but we have to conclude here. But if you have more questions for Jasper, you can type them in the Google Docs and uh, Jasper, you can have a look at them later. I, I think also at the end of the presentation, it's still possible. I think Jasper, you will stay with us for a while or will you leave now? Um, no, I will uh, uh, stay in the meeting, no yeah, problem. Yeah, so if there's any questions there's later on. There is yeah. more questions, uh, more a possibility to ask more questions for Jasper. Uh, sure. Okay. Let's move to the next speaker then, uh, who is uh, Mohamed El Hafiani uh, from Université Moulay Ismail, that is in the beautiful city of Meknes in Morocco. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Uh, there you are, uh, Mohamed. Yes, so you maybe can try to upload your presentation. This goes smoothly. Great. Um, yes, Mohamed, the floor is yours. Same system, uh, audience. If you have questions already now, you can type in the chat. Uh, and afterwards we'll have uh, an yeah, opportunity to discuss. Go okay. ahead. Uh, okay, first of all, I want uh, to like, uh, uh, I would like to, to thank my professor, uh, Anton van Wappay, for giving me this uh, opportunity to present for you my presentation work. Uh, my research is about uh, impact of recent uh, urban expansion on the regional water balances in, uh, water balance in, in Morocco. So I'm working with the, uh, uh, Professor Ali Salawi from uh, Molisma University uh, in Meknes, Morocco, and Professor Anton Van Opey from uh, Kailoven University of Belgium. The outline of my presentation is as follows. I will start uh, uh, first, I will start to introduce uh, the problems, challenges, and, uh, and objective of my study. 
uh, in the second time, uh, I will discuss the methodology of this work uh, and uh, I will move uh, to the result. Uh, we discussing overall accuracy of the classification, uh, land use land cover changes uh, in Meknes and uh, Bufakan watershed. Uh, urban grounds of Meknes during the period 1919 and 2080. And I will finish this part uh, by discuss um, water availability and water demand uh, in the whole watershed. And I will finish with uh, a conclusion. So worldwide, uh, the total volume of water is estimated at uh, uh, 1.4 billion uh, cubic kilometers, but only 2.5 uh, as considered as fresh water. But importantly, uh, we have just 0.5 of this fresh water uh, is available and we can find it as aquifer, rainfall, ratuary lakes, reservoirs, and rivers. And related to the population, uh, we have about 66% uh, percent of the world population suffer for, from water scarcity. And we are now uh, about uh, 7 billion uh, inhabitants in, uh, 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 on the earth. And uh, this population is accentuated uh, uh, in settlements of urban domain. And we are now about uh, 5.6 billion people in urban domain. This is up uh, from uh, 69 in 1975 uh, to uh, uh, 76% in 2050. So uh, the, Mediterranean, the Mediterranean region is uh, one of uh, the most affected regions by water scarcity because of several factors like uh, extreme natural internal variability, global warming, seasonality of water sources, and decreasing uh, stream flows forecasting coming decades. So why uh, integrated water resources management is pertinent for Morocco? Uh, according to the World the Bank, Morocco's population, urban population was about 20 million in 2050 and expected to be uh, increased uh, in, uh, uh, to uh, 32 million uh, by uh, uh, 2050. Uh, it's about uh, 60, uh, 60 uh, it's about 56 percent uh, of growth. Uh, and we can see in this figure how the population, uh, the population, the total population in Morocco is coming uh, to increase all the time, and also the urban population all the time is increasing. But for the rural, it's come uh, just uh, constant. So uh, for uh, the demand projection, uh, so uh, so uh, increasing uh, increase uh, for uh, projection of water demand between 2040 and 2050, and expected to be increased in the most town in Morocco. And we can say, for example, for Casablanca is about 66 uh, percent, and also for Tangier is about 80 um, uh, percent. For, for Meknes, it's our study area. We will see uh, what's happened in, in this area by this study. So uh, our uh, area for application is uh, Bufakran watershed, uh, located in the center north of Morocco in the whole basin uh, of Sibu. Uh, this, uh, this, the area of our watershed is about uh, 1,400 square kilometers is characterized by very important areas for uh, agricultural practice with a high quality of soil and very large quantity of water resources. With uh, the presence for uh, the two town is uh, Meknes and also Bufakran in the center of uh, watershed. So with the urban grout in our study area and also with the population grout and uh, agricultural de development, uh, we have all the time increasing water consumption and water demand, and we need to elaborate uh, like um, uh, a, a system for integrated spatial analysis of water resources. For that, in the first time, in the first uh, type, uh, in the first step, we um, we started with um, studying land use land cover changes during the last 13 years in our study area. So uh, this is the methodology after uh, radiometric calibration, atmospheric correction, and extraction of um, the study area uh, by using lenses sensor uh, satellites. Uh, we have uh, uh, 
thematic mapper image and also uh, enhanced thematic mapper and OLE image. We made uh, a maximum likelihood classification and uh, this map show uh, the field survey points uh, and we have uh, a lot of land uh, use uh, land cover categories like urban areas, cereals, uh, free trees, artif artificial lakes, um, we have olive trees and also we have a forest. And uh, the, the classification was evaluated by using confusion uh, matrix uh, and using field survey points. So um, uh, three land cover map uh, were um, uh, exported uh, for 1919, 2010, 2080. And by using um, the report for uh, directorate, uh, uh, directorate, uh, regional directorate of agriculture, and also if all reports and census data and a lot a lot of survey uh, were, were made in our study area we calculate and we estimated water demand for each category for assessing water balances in our uh, watershed so the classification um, for the classification six uh, categories were taken in, uh, in consideration that we have cereals arboriculture forests urban area, bare soil, and natural vegetation. And the classification show uh, an overall accuracy, it's like precision for um, uh, more than 80% uh, for 2080. And for 2010, we have 70% uh, and uh, about 67% uh, for uh, 1919 with Kappa index more uh, than 0 0.8 uh, for 2080 and 0 0.5 for uh, the two period of 1919 and 2003. We have, uh, we find uh, some uh, confusion uh, in our, uh, in our uh, matrix and we find it sometime between arboriculture and cereals and arboriculture and fruit trees. And this is mainly due to um, uh, response, uh, spectral response of these categories. Uh, it's a little bit uh, similar. Uh, also, we can say that for uh, that's the classification show a good perception for the classification of the urban area with um, uh, a precision more than uh, uh, 96 for uh, the three, uh, three dates. Uh, this table show the area change for different land use land cover changes. Uh, and uh, uh, we can say that for the urban area is uh, ha have have um, has been uh, has been increased about two times, and uh, uh, we have uh, with the degradation of the forest in uh, the middle atlas we have a decline uh, about uh, two times also. So this map show uh, land use land cover changes uh, for uh, 1919 and 2080. Uh, this is the Mekna city, and we can say how the urban uh, area are uh, experience, uh, experienced a uh, very big expansion uh, and also uh, the degradation of the forest in the Middle Atlas. So this map show, um, uh, show the Mekna city and uh, the build-up uh, in 1919 and also the build-up growth uh, between 1919 and 2003 and after 2003. Uh, we can say that Meknas experienced uh, the operation of new uh, established uh, in uh, its surrounding, especially in the southeastern, uh, we can say this place, and also in the northeastern of, uh, of Meknas, with about uh, 26 projects uh, on a surface of uh, about um, uh, 822 uh, hectares. For uh, water availability, so uh, water demand, uh, water demand, or water availability and water demand, uh, we have calculated and estimated uh, water uh, demand for each category, uh, and uh, uh, we projected the data for uh, 2030. So uh, uh, the changes uh, that uh, occurred uh, on the land use of Bofakran River watershed and uh, the increase in agriculture areas uh, like cereals and uh, arboriculture results an increase of water demand uh, during the same period for, um, uh, for uh, the whole uh, watershed. And also the projected data show that the water demand for uh, the population, cereals, 
uh, will be increased uh, in uh, the next coming year. Also, um, uh, also for uh, the impacts of water uh, demand, uh, the impact of uh, of land use land cover changes will be um, uh, will will affect also the groundwater, and we can say uh, like for the piezometric history of the aquifer, uh, show a general decline about one meter each uh, each year in, in average. As a result, during the last 17 years, this level have uh, has declined uh, by almost 20, 20 meters. And um, this had, uh, has led uh, to the disappearance of uh, the groundwater in, in some places uh, in the uh, in the Strait, and uh, consequently uh, to the uh, lead to the transformation of, uh, of the agriculture system uh, from an, an irrigated system to uh, a rainfed system. So as a conclusion, uh, this study in the length spatial temporal monitoring of land use, land cover changes, water availability and water demand in uh, the Bukvakran watershed, uh, Meknes, Morocco. Uh, the results show uh, that the urban area arboriculture and cereals increased, uh, while the forests are uh, decreased by about 78%. Uh, the, de the development uh, of, uh, of uh, the agriculture uh, had also an effect on water demand. Um, this research can be uh, of available contribution in decision uh, making regarding the planning and the implementation of sustainable agriculture policies and uh, the elaboration of uh, strategies uh, for efficient and sustainable integrated water resource management. I would just to say that this work uh, have been published in Water uh, last year, and it was uh, this. This is just uh, the first um, uh, the first part of our work, and we're working now uh, for water demand for agriculture, uh, and uh, also uh, the water demand uh, also the water demand for uh, for uh, population. And thank you. This is my presentation, Anton. Okay, thank you, Mohamed. Great. Uh, your English is uh, very good, even better than mine. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, thank you. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> so, questions, questions for uh, Mohamed. Uh, uh, nothing in the chat for the moment, so I'll have to open, I'm sorry, the participant list. Yes, there is a hand from Martin van Strien again. Uh, Martin, you have a question for Mohamed, or was your hand just still raised all the time? I don't know. Martin? Um, oh, sorry, no, that was uh, it, it was from the previous. Ah, it was from the previous. <laughs> question. Yeah, so you have sorry. to unraise, I think, somehow. I don't know whether that's possible. Okay. Questions for Mohamed? If not, I'll, I will start maybe with a question, Mohammed. I've, I've been in your uh, study area uh, and I've seen the changes that, that lead to the rapid uh, depletion of the groundwater. I think um, my question is a bit, is there already negative feedback uh, in, in your system in a sense that because of the uh, lack of groundwater, the farmers will maybe abandon certain places and as such, the, the consumption of, of, of uh, groundwater or water uh, in general uh, is uh, is slowing down. Is that is that already detectable in the area or not? Yeah, 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 Prof. Anton. And uh, um, just in the last month, uh, when um, when I was in the field, uh, I asked uh, a lot of uh, agriculture because uh, we have uh, sometimes um, uh, the groundwater is uh, uh, have already. Um, uh, have already finished it. And when we ask the agriculture, there is some impact on uh, like the transformation because a lot of uh, agriculture in the region uh, at the past, uh, they working with uh, like irrigated system, but now just rain fed. Okay. Because, because for the groundwater now um, it's coming uh, less and less uh, all the time because of uh, the over uh, the uh, the over ex uh, exploitation of um, the very big agriculture and also we have um, uh, the quantity of groundwater is coming uh, from time to time to uh, uh, is, is decreasing all the time that's the problem 
Yeah. And is there some reaction from the government then in terms of maybe taxation of, of uh, groundwater extraction or increase of the price of the water or is it just yeah, because a simple process? Yeah, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the program of uh, Maroc Ver or bien uh, Green Morocco, this, uh, the, there is some sub, uh, subvention for uh, the agriculture because all the uh, all the agriculture uh, uh, they have uh, uh, the agriculture that they have uh, more than five uh, five hectare, they, they gives them subvention to um, to adapt like uh, drop irrigation or something like that. Okay, good. Um, is there other questions from Mohammed? Mohammed did uh, hear this, yeah, okay. Participant list. I don't see any, any hands raised right now. So if there is more questions, you can type them in the document or later at the end. Um, okay, Prof. Anton. Presentation. Okay, thanks a lot, Mohamed. And uh, Thank you, Prof. Yeah, stay online, please, because at the end we'll have a... a okay, I will say. You will, uh, you will get more questions. I will stay at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's now move to a completely different time zone, which is Hanoi. So Anton, I just this is Lauren. I just want to let you know that we're having a little bit of technical problems. Uh huh. I yeah. Go is, ahead. Is that, uh, see if you can speak now. Ah, I can speak now. Okay, good. Um, yes. So let's move to the third presentation, which is uh, uh, by by Wang Wong, um, who is in uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, Wong, can you hear us? You can unmute. I can see one more in the list, but can you hear us? She's unmuted. She's unmuted. Mm. Hello, you hear me? Wong, what's the time now in Hanoi? Maybe you're super tired. Eh? I can imagine it's maybe 11 p.m. or something. Hello. Uh, maybe my. Yeah. yeah we, we can hear, hear you now. now. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, now I can hear. You. Okay, hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hello. Maybe my internet is unstable. Sorry. But now it's I am. Okay, well, we'll okay. give it a try anyway. What's the time yeah. in Wang Wong in, uh, in uh, Hanoi? Yeah. What's the time with you? How, how late is it? Uh, now it's uh, 8 p.m. 11 p.m.? Now it's uh, 8 p.m. No, uh, 8 p.m. 8 in PM, Hanoi. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So for, yeah. for you, late evening session, but thanks yeah. for joining us. So maybe you can upload your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, do you see my presentation? Yes, I can see the presentation. You can maybe move to presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then we can... Yes, okay. okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Hương Hoang, a lecturer from the Faculty of Geography, Vietnam National University. Um, I was um, a former PhD student of Professor Van Rompuy, and today is my pleasure to show you a part of my research about the impact of tourism development on the local livelihood and land cover chain in the northern Vietnamese highlands. Uh, my uh, research was conducted in uh, Sapa, a mountainous uh, area in the north Vietnam. Uh, it's area about um, 700 kilometers square uh, with population is about 50,000 people. Uh, Sapa is known as a famous uh, tourism destination. Um, Sapa has high percent potential for tourism development uh, thanks to the diversity in both landscape and ethnic diversity. Uh, there are six ethnic um, 
minority group living together here uh, uh, and there is a strong relationship between to topography and um, uh, distribution of ethnic group for example the homo and now people normally like they live in the steep forest uh, the, the slopes about the eight uh, hundred meter um, above the sea level why other group for example Thai and uh, Zai normally they live in the lower elevation and Isapa have uh, also the king people uh, they migrate from the Laoland and to the Sapa and normally located in the, the town. Uh, since uh, 1993, the Sapa was open fully for international tourism. And since that time, the number of tourists uh, come here increased very quickly. You can see in this uh, figure. Um, and the number of uh, tourists increased in both uh, the international and domestic to the tourism here is some uh, pictures so the tourism activity in uh, Sapa uh, from the context of Sapa a research question was right is uh, can life li livelihood diversification and tourism activity be a driver of forest cultivation in this area uh, to answer this uh, resource question, we use uh, the, um, the the land cover map uh, conducted from uh, remote sensing data. Uh, here we have two maps, uh, a land cover map in 2002 uh, con uh, conducted from aerial photo and the um, 2012 uh, detected from the very high uh, resolution spot image images and we have um, in order to uh, access uh, the relationship between tourism development and uh, local livelihood we use uh, the household interview data um, we interview uh, nearly 500 households uh, in the sapa both uh, village uh, in the tourism center and remote uh, village was select, uh, uh, selected selected yeah and then interview household was a uh, cluster into different livelihood typology um and then uh, we take a comparison between this different group uh, household to find out the um, the dif uh, uh, different between uh, uh, them finally finally multi logistic regression was uh, carried out uh, to um, to detect the driver of land use change at household level. Uh, we, we use a semi-structure questionnaire to collect uh, household information, for example, household characteristics, um, evol evolution of arable land, and income and outcome of household, and uh, also the living expense sorry uh, here is uh, some uh, uh, interview activity uh, we use uh, the the map and questionnaire to uh, to collect the information from household uh, and then uh, finally multi logistic regression uh, technique was applied to uh, to find out uh, which is a driver of uh, land cover chain in, uh, in Sapa. Uh, for multi logistic regression model, we uh, divided variable in two groups uh, depend, dependent variable and independent variable. Uh, in this model, the dependent variable is a uh, uh, dependent variable is uh, the change in the arable land, for example, land abandonment. Uh, pet detail extension, they are binary variable. Independent variable include both categorical and numerical variable, for example, livelihood size, ethnicity, uh, tourism income, agriculture income, investment in agriculture, living expense, and household size. 
uh, we use uh, the XL start software to carry, to run the multi logistic regression. Now I want to show you the first result uh, about the impact of tourism on local livelihood. Uh, this figure shows you the three uh, dif uh, three different uh, livelihood uh, typology. Um, the first the first one is a uh, uh, F household, it means the household uh, with full time uh, farming. Um, and the second group is a uh, farming household with limited involved in tourism. And the third group uh, was called as FD plus. It means the, the household with major involvement in tourism. Each um, figure show you the um, truck uh, diagram. As, um, it's uh explain um here is is each uh figure show you the the source of income and outcome of each household uh, typology uh this figure show the first uh, household group with, with full time from uh, main activity um here is uh, the the, their income includes the capital, land, labor, and outcome is uh, the the cost uh, out, outcome and their living expense. Uh, the first group uh, seem to be good because they have uh, additional uh, cost income from the uh, cardamom is a kind of uh, buy and medical crops, uh, so they have a uh, uh, I increase uh, road as a motorbike, TV, and nice house. This group, uh, although not involved in tourism, but they still uh, seem to be good because they have additional income from the uh, crops. The second household group is uh, the the house uh, is uh, limited in both in in tourism. Although involved in tourism, but they seem to be the poorest um, uh, household because ad additional income from tourism is just for survival. Uh, they uh, without uh, investment in uh, in in um, agriculture activity. The third group is a household with a major involvement in tourism you can see in this figure this um this uh, uh, group seem to be richest uh, households uh, because they they have uh, uh, they uh, invest so income from uh, tourism uh, was uh invest uh, invest in, uh, in agri um, intensification in agriculture, such as they use uh, income from tourism to to buy um, uh, chemical fertilizer or high priest seed with higher um, uh, production agricultural production, and this uh, group seems to be richest with very uh, nice homestay and modern equipment. Uh, however, however, the the impact of tourism is a strong, a strongly location dependent. You can see in this map, the green dot is um, full-time farming household. Uh, the yellow dot is a household with my uh, limited involved in tourism. And the red dot is a house with household with mainly income from uh, tourism. So the the um, red dot only concentrates in the tourism center. It means uh, only household uh, living close to the tourism center can benefit from the uh, off farm uh, uh, activity. And the second reason, so the impact of tourism on land use change, you can see uh, comparison between two maps. So that the 
since 2002 and 2012, the uh, forest uh, seemed to um, error increase while the arable land and shrub decrease, especially the upland fields seem to be uh, decreased uh, quickly. The monthly logistic request and reason so the, the relationship between the how, uh, uh, land use chain and household typology. Uh, here you can see the relationship between FT plus household with the land abandonment and petty field extension. This means that the household with more involvement in tourism seem to be abandoned the upland field uh, because upland field is um, um, less fertilized um, while the and the FT plus household seem to be uh, less expansion their petty field. So the question is uh, why the household in more involvement in tourism seem to be abandoned um, their upland field. Yeah, to answer this question, uh, we uh, found that the uh, tourism activity not only impact on uh, household income, but also effects on um, labor division at household level. Yeah, uh, um, tourism uh, results in less uh, interested in farming, so they seem uh, to be the prefer to abandon the, um, the upland land field. And tourism activity also caused the chain of labor division uh, because the Tourism mainly offer the job for women. Um, yeah, you can see in th this picture, uh, most uh, women involved in tourism activity, uh, while the men stay at home for uh, take care of children and household management. Um, Yeah, because uh, as less tourism, so uh, it means the less available labor for uh, farming activity. Um, so mar marginal marginal land was prefer uh, to abandon, and uh, forest uh, seem to be regrowth of the abandoned land. Yeah, from our research, we have uh, some uh, conclusion. Um, first, and the tourism increased the average living standard of ethnic minority household and led to more intensive farming system with forest regrow on the abandoned field. Uh, however, the impact of tourism is location dependent. Many only household in the close to the tourism center can benefit from uh, this um, off-farm activity. For the remote release intensification of farming activity with production uh, for market-oriented crop uh, to supply the tourist demand might be an alternative way to raise the, the household income for the household um, located far from the tourism center. Yeah, that's all my presentation. For more detail, you can uh, read our published article uh, on the journal Environment Development and Sustainability uh, Journal. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to um, receive your comment and uh, uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hello. Um That was a very uh, nice presentation. Uh, can you hear? Yeah. yeah, we can still hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Of such a beautiful country and such a beautiful place. Eh? So when the pandemic is over, I can recommend mm -hmm. everyone to uh, to visit Vietnam and especially that northwestern part of Vietnam. Is there questions for one? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. 
maybe you have to think a bit. In the meantime, Wong, I, I have already, already have a question. Now, because of the pandemic, I can understand that there's no tourism at all in the Sapa area. Huh? Yeah. Does this mean then, what does this mean for the local people that they go back to their former farming practices and that maybe there is again a kind of deforestation going on? Because you show in your paper that tourism yeah, leads to land abandonment and as such is, is, is uh, yeah, initiating a forest transition, but is it now going the other way? Is there signs already that this is happening or not yet? I'm sorry. I... Did you understand my question? Yeah, can you repeat? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what is happening now yeah, with the people that, that were involved in tourism, but now because there's no tourists, are they focusing again on the farming ah, and deforesting? In post-COVID. Yeah, now in the post-COVID time. Yeah, because... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 because uh, now COVID, um, so the, all the uh, tourism industry were, is impacted. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, not only in Sapa but other region. So maybe the, during the COVID time, the people in Sapa they have to come back to the agriculture activity to survival <laughs> in this yeah. uh, hard time. Yeah. yeah. But, but were you but able? I, to, were you able to visit the Sapa area in the in the past year, or also for you the area was closed? I can imagine. No, no, because for a long time I, I, I didn't come back to Sapa since I finished my uh, PhD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, now there is some questions in the chat, uh, Wong. Um, uh, um, can you read these questions or should I read them for you? Yeah, I so, so. so I will read them for you one. So there was one question by Kim Su Yu. Uh, yeah. yeah, can you see it? Topography is related to ethnic groups. What scale of topography were you talking yeah, yeah. about? Could you answer that? It's related to any what scale of topography are you talking about? Um, yeah. I, I, I thought that there is strong relationship between topography and ethnic uh, distribution of ethnic group. So topography, I mean, is uh, the, the elevation because uh, some group, uh, ethnic group, are, they only living in the high elevation, but other group, they live uh, only in the valley of, um, yeah. Topography. Yeah, the scale yeah, of the topography. topography. I mean, here is the the village scale. The the, the scale of these villages. Uh, villages high and low. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question yeah. is about what yeah. is the impact? Yeah. What is the impact of tourism on the local uh, on the local uh, culture? Culture. Yeah. The impact of the yeah, tourism. Yeah, I think it's um. Culture. Actually, yeah, yeah, it's a strong impact of tourism because uh, um, um, because uh, the many uh, to, um, on the I have uh, the impact of tourism on cultural uh, have uh, both uh, advantage and disadvantage uh, at the. Uh, advantage um, aspect because uh, local people they have a, to to keep the traditional country to attract uh, tourists that is a, I think that is an advantage um, but on in the um, this advantage is uh, the fact that uh, due to the the, the to, uh, tourism income, so many children, they have quit out of the school to, yeah, to, 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 to earn my, to um, take a tourism job, to, uh, to get money from tourism activity. Yeah, that is, uh, so uh, tourism have a both uh, 
disadvantage and give this advantage to the country. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Wang. I don't see any immediate questions for you now, but if there's questions yeah. later, you can always type them in the in the notes. Huh? Yeah. Uh, okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Wang. But don't go away because maybe there is now uh, in this uh, final discussion that we have some some more questions or mm -hmm. remarks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I have a question maybe uh, uh, that maybe links or links not the, the presentation of Jasper van Vliet with, with the presentation of Wang Wong. You think, Wang, that that uh, the tourism is also in that rural area a driver of uh, urbanization in a way that uh, it was completely rural before? Is it now generating some form of urbanization, this tourism? Wong, well, that's a question for you. Yeah. What? Is, is, I, is Sapa urbanizing now or not? Uh, now it's uh, Sapa is an uh, open urban area. It's a uh, uh, upgroup up group into the town. Yeah, in the city. Yeah. And what type of urbanization is it then? If you compare it to the different types that, that Jasper presented, is it extensive? Expansion or is it also intensification of the of the urban area? Um, in Sapa, I think it's a. Uh, um, I think both expansion and intensification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, I have the yeah, same question for you. Uh, the area. Yeah, expansion yeah. of the area. Yeah. Okay. And Mohamed, yeah, in your yeah. study area in, in Morocco, what, what type of urbanization would you say that is? Is it intensification of urban exp of a really expansion? Mohamed? Mm, yes, I yes, think it's uh, expansion. In Sapa, it's, it's expansion. It's, and in, in, in Meknes? Is it expansion or yeah, intensification? Expansion. Yeah, expansion. Expansion, probably. Also expansion, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I don't think I don't think that uh, the tourism is uh, a driver for uh, urbanization in Meknes. Because we have uh, because we have just uh, we have uh, we have just uh, tourism in the old uh, oldest Medina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a different form of tourism, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Is there more questions for one of the speakers, their audience? Because I promised when I uh, when we started with the organization that the sessions would not take longer than one hour and a half because otherwise your attention goes down anywhere. So we have maximum five minutes left. But there is this Google Doc on which you can um, ask further questions to the speakers, of course, or even send them an email later. Okay. If not, I would uh, like to communicate one more thing with you. That is that we uh, are still looking for speakers in. Um, in the coming two uh, months. So there's two more sessions of this series, uh, one in May, one in June, and for both we need uh, we need speakers. So even if you have a research that is not completed yet, or even if you feel uh, a bit intimidated by the senior uh, presenters in, in, in some of the series, uh, don't feel intimidated and, and, uh, and be a bit bold and you can present. And, and it, uh, even if the research is not yet published or final, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, way to um, yeah, advertise yourself a bit and your research. Yeah? So you can send me an email uh, and then we can see whether we can schedule you in, uh, in one of the two upcoming sessions. So uh, you're more, more than welcome. Okay, having said this, I wish you a further uh, a good day or a good evening. Um, is there any timeline for submitting? No, you just send me an email and then um, uh, Yalal, and then then we can schedule you uh, on a date that, that suits you. And if we still have a free time slot, of course, but there's not really a deadline, but not two days before the session, of course, then the program will be complete. Yeah, presenters, uh, you could stay online uh, for a while while the others leave, uh, because we're going to do a debrief session of this, uh, of this seminar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, so goodbye all. Thanks a lot for your presence. It was a nice and diverse group and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something about it. Okay, bye. Yeah.